but we are poised to write, rewrite some of the future that perhaps would have been written differently if not for the pandemic and the shaking that has taken place. And the, the, the joy for us, friends, is that God knew this. We all claim God knew the pandemic. This didn't surprise God. I've heard every one of you say that. Well, then if that's true, <laughs> then God knew it would hit in America and what we've gone through would have happened with you being elders in the church. Meaning He picked you to lead His people through this. Because He planned, He knew, and He called you. So all the unknowns and the un things that we're we finding our way, God said, I've put you here to do what I've called you to do. So if he knew this was happening and knew it was coming and knew you were leading, well, then he's got this. And that's not just a, a like, yeah, yeah, Tyron. That's got to come true to us. I, I, you know, I talk to my dad as much as I can, and he's never led NCMI through a pandemic. He, but I now am. And it's like God in this season. It's not that I know what I'm doing, but God chose it. You just got to lead through it and go to God and stop asking people for perspective and ask this great God to show us. And so it's such an exciting season. It really is with so many unknowns, absolutely, and so many things going on. But I really want to just encourage us this season, this year, coming into this season. I know we're a month in already, but just what happened last year was a great thing and a tough thing. But this year is different to last year. And what happened last year should not determine the future of the church. The future God has should determine what we get on with now. Yeah. Clean slate. Shaken. Things have happened. There's yeah. a whole lot of stuff that's gone down. And I feel like we've got this clean slate to just lead God's people the right way, what God intended, without adding all this extra stuff that just gets in the way. Good stuff, yeah. but gets in the way of what God's doing. And so there's simplicity there's authenticity. There's just the reality of leading His people into their glorious inheritance. And I, I want to just ch talk around some of this tonight and remind you, because I know their voices and I know everyone's coming at you. And, and I, I it maybe just want to take the Word of God and say, let's read it as a mirror tonight rather than this lens again that we talk. We love the future we talk about, but we've got to come back and live this. And so go with me to 1 Peter. You knew this was coming, I'm sure. You, 1 Peter chapter 5. I want to try and get to some practical things tonight, but I, I'm saying try, okay? Because I do feel like we've got to get better at equipping and talking about how-tos uh, going forward, empowering and equipping. I really feel like we're good at empowering guys in that, but we've got to talk around some of the equipping and, and how-tos so we can be far more effective. Yeah. And not my way, just some ways we can do this and be effective in what God has for us. But let's go to 1 Peter quickly, chapter 5. Father, as we gather around these truths again, would you stir us? Would you convince us? Would you remind us, but beyond a thought, to action, to adjust, to look at the lenses of Scripture, but also to look at this mirror that will give us courage and adjust us to be what you've called us to be, to do what you've called us to do, to, to take off what's been put on us. I even sense tonight, honesty, some of those armor, Saul's armor needs to come off. To hear what God wants us to hear, not what people have told us we need to do. And the simplicity of who He's made us to be, and the simplicity of this mandate He's called us to, to have the freedom to, to be who we called to be, but to step in and step up in this season. So, Father, help me and help us. May I say what you want us to hear today. May you put aside my thoughts, put aside my desires. May it just be you giving life. And may we eat fresh bread tonight. May we eat well. May we be fed by your word, challenged by these truths. And, in, and, and equip better to lead your people going forward in this season, we pray. We give you all the praise, Jesus. We, we realize this is your church, you building your church. You're the leader of the church. We're not. You lead us tonight. Lead us. Have your way, Jesus. Take your place in all areas, not in some, in all. 
May we not wrestle with you tonight. May we just submit and surrender. May we not arm wrestle through, but just come to that place of, yes, Lord, you've called us. We'll say yes to what you're doing. I pray your blessing over our, my friends here tonight. Be with us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. First Peter chapter 5. Let's read together. It says, To the elders, <laughs> I think it's good we hear this from the Word of God. To the elders, presby uh, the presbyteros among you, I, appear as, uh, I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's suffering, and one who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you're willing, as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted yeah. to you, but being examples to the flock. A pause for a minute. A true shepherd leads the way. They do not merely point the way. A true shepherd leads the way. Entrusted, he says, by being examples to the flock. Again, guys, having followers does not mean you're leading. Yeah. Leadership in the kingdom requires service yeah. and sacrifice. Yeah. Verse 4, and when the chief shepherd appears, the sanity of it all. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Yeah. That's, That's why... You do what you do. If it be for any other reason, you must quit. You will quit. But what we do, what you do, Peter gets and says it's not for what you do here on earth. Recognition on earth is irrelevant. It's forever where it never fades away. It's got to stir us, guys. It stirs me, and I'm not even an elder anymore, but this is one of those go-to texts. Nicole and I have tried to talk about every Monday morning, every time we led a church, was take to this verse 4 and say, this is not done for these people. This is not done for the region. This is not done. This is done simply for Him. And even if no one sees it, He does. And it's probably better no one sees it, because when He sees it, my eternal reward will be never fading away. So just know that. I know you know that. But I know it's been through some difficult moments, some of you guys, and maybe even now. Not only trying to live your own life, trying to lead God's people. I'm just telling you, it's not for them. Not for them. Yeah. It's for Him. Yeah. Just do it for Him. Yeah. Let, the, let Him see it. That's all that yeah. matters. Yeah. Verse 5, young men. Again, I was a little reluctant. Why young men? Young men. That's me. I'm here. <laughs> Young men, I saw someone I was telling TK, I saw a post today. Someone said, don't get offended, old and young here, but they said, uh, the boomers and the millennial, millennials need to stop moaning about how they irritate each other. There's one in between both of you. There's a group in between both of you who've been irritated nonstop by both of you. <laughs> That's called Gen X's, and here I am, so thank you. Just Anyway, young men, young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. Then he says, all of you clothe yourself with humility toward one another. Because God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him. Because He cares for you. Yeah. No one else cares. It doesn't matter. He cares. Yeah. Yeah. Cast all your... Just, I mean, can I challenge you pastors? Don't cast your anxiety on your people. Mm -hmm. Cast all anxiety on Him. Mm -hmm. Why? Because He cares. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't endure. He cares. Be self-controlled 
and alert. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Ah, I love that. Don't be fearful. Don't be afraid. Be aware, but resist him. Standing firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are under the same kind of suffering. And the God of all grace who's called to you Called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power ever and ever. Amen. This is a crazy, crazy time. And I think we have to get better at identifying what's going on. So we can actually see what God's doing in it and also respond accordingly as the church, as leaders, leading God's people through this. We often talk about what do you see and how do you see and it does matter. It seems in scripture God cares about what we see because we got to see what he wants us to see and know what he's doing in the midst of it all. And, and I've shared some of these things, but I feel like there's such a a burden in a good sense, it's not a heaviness, to come back to these things and say, we must, in this season, in this nation, know what's happening, identify of what's going on there so we can address it and effectively lead ourselves and our people into this incredible inheritance through it all when we're seeing what's happening here. So what I'm sharing, it's not new, but I feel to say this again, and if I had the privilege of preaching in any of your churches, I would be covering some of these things because I think our people need to know what's going on so we can address it. And when you know what you're called to, you know what's going on. When you can make some sense of it and see God in it, then you live with courage and actually can say, okay, God's got this. Not all our plans have fallen apart. No, no, God's leading, God's doing stuff. I mean, this nation has been rocked, friends, and, and I know that I'm an immigrant with an accent, and, and I'm trying to honor how most Americans would feel right now, especially in the church with Christianity being so linked to the political arena. It's relevant. It's real. It's 200 and something years of God and government. And, and I'm not here to talk politics, but I'm telling you there's a true separation, and there's a pain when you are... Always taught that government matters for God's purposes to be fulfilled. And then suddenly government changes and all the prophets got it wrong. And suddenly we begin to question everything that's happening. And we begin to doubt the plans of God because we've been told if you don't get the right government, God can't function. And so there's a genuine pain and sadness in the American church. There's a fear in the American church. There is a hostility. There's a, a lostness because of our election. I mean, how tragic, but true. And so I'm trying to walk through this gently because I know there are pastors and leaders who are basically in depression over this. And I, I kind of understand it, but I can't understand. But it's real. It's real. <laughs> But God doesn't want us linked to some gathering or some group or some politician with all due respect. And I, I'm not here to talk politics, but there's a separation. And I think even the Senate, with all due respect, what happened there was God saying, I do not want you as a church to have your faith in any government. So I'll remove it all. And even if you say it's stolen or whatever, I'm not getting political. God allowed it to happen. Why? So man's faith will be in God alone. Why? For the leaders and the church to come back to loyalty to God, not loyalty to any party or government. And I know it's hard to hear this, guys, because you've grown up here. I have it. And it's so real. It's so, it's so ingrained. But God's committed to His church to get it out. And I'm not saying it doesn't matter what government we have. It does. But God's not concerned. He's not, oh dear, it didn't work. Oh dear, now what? God's like, let me show you. Your faith must be in me. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So right now, what's happening is we have people sinning like never before in this nation and around the world. And here's the thing. It's not even hidden. Yeah. Yeah. 
it is exposed and with all due respect, it seems like no one cares. So what? Oh, well. So you've got man sinning like never before. Sin's always been here. We know from creation and how sin came. But it's now been exposed, guys. And, and I want to just tell you, if that's all that was happening, it would be a lot easier for us to minister and address it because that would be the one thing we, we identify. Go read 2 Timothy chapter 3. Please go read it. And it talks about godlessness in these last days. And it's lovers of themselves, people. It's real. It's now. Are these last days? I think so. I've always said I believe it anyway. But it's more and more current and relevant and real. And so you've got man sinning. And we are mad. We are, how can this happen? Where's justify? Where's, where's just God? Where's justice and all this stuff? It's out there. And man is sinning. And that's what's happening right now. At the very same time as man sinning, which would be bad enough, you've got the devil raging. I want to just tell you, we've just read he's prowling around. Be alert. Be aware. It's not to live in fear, but we've got the devil raging like never before. He is a rager. He's a deceiver. He's looking to devour. He comes to steal, kill, destroy. We know all these truths. And all of us, let me just be straight. Talk about we our battles not against flesh and blood. That's what Paul says in Ephesians 6. Our battles not against flesh and blood. But the devil uses flesh and blood. And we could be used by him to come against flesh and blood. Fancy that. He's using the church to divide the church. He's using leaders to take each other out because he's raging. And he's, we keep saying our battle's not against flesh and blood, but we go against flesh and blood rather than principalities and powers and authorities and rulers. Are you, are you there? We play into it. I play, you play. I get mad on social media. I look at this person liking that person. I'm like, how can you even like that? And... Who's behind all that? Can I suggest the enemy? And he's having a field day and he's raging. And we are raging in the name of Jesus. So I mean, that's bad enough, right? Trying to unite people in the season and the world is so divided and the church is so divided and we're doing our best. Man, we've got man sinning and at the very same time you've got the devil raging. That's bad enough. Those two things would be bad enough. And that's where most people are focusing. But I want to suggest there's a third thing happening that's more important than those two. And at this time, in this season, at the same time, we've got God shaking. I think we're giving too much glory to the devil and too much glory to the sin of man. When God says, hang on, I'm in this thing too, and I'm shaking. And let me tell you, God's always shaking, but it's like he's exposing and shaking like never before. Not just in America, around the world today. Can I say, in the church and out of the church. Now you, you just, that's the season we're in. Man sinning, God, sh- uh, God shaking and the devil raging. Welcome to the season we're in, leading God's people in and through this. It's not easy. God is shaking. Hebrews chapter 12, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, we all claim, you know what, it's so cool that only, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Yeah, that's what's happening. We love to say, yeah, of course, only the kingdom stands. So the stuff that's falling in our lives and in our churches and in that church globally, that that's falling, not kingdom. And I mean, we've had a year or so of this thing. Therefore, since we're receiving it, verse 28 says of Hebrews 12, a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. (laughs) And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Why? For our God is a consuming fire. So I, I want to just tell you guys, there is a whole lot of shaking God's doing right now. Has done, is doing. And I want to just say that part of the shaking opens up some doors for us yes, to walk that's through. Right. That's right. I want to tell you that I've been negative when I talk about shaking because shaking's not easy. Shaking's terrible. Shaking's horrible because everything you trust falls out. Everything you've put your faith in is getting wrecked and shaken. The truth that you believe has been shaken. I've seen people fall out of the race. I've seen people fall away. I've seen things fall down. I've seen churches close. I've seen ministries shut down. The shaking's painful. And so often when it's painful, we highlight the negativity of the shake. But God's recently, a few weeks ago, worshiping at Redemption City on Sunday morning, God spoke to me about the shaking and the good things that are coming out of the shaking. 
but we've got to look at the negative, but we also best look at what God's doing because He doesn't want us just to see the bad. He wants us to identify the good in the day so we can lead God's people well. God shakes us for a few reasons. One of them is to show us what's really inside, to reveal what's inside. Man, guys, let's be honest. If we can be for a minute, but there's a lot of ugly stuff that's come out of some of us. Out of the church. I can't believe the stuff that's going. But God will shake, and when you shake, what comes out reveals what's inside. God, you know, God is so good to us. The Bible says the kindness of God that leads us to repent. God is so kind that He will reveal to us in our hearts what's in there in this season so we can adjust and address it rather than think things are good and one day go to heaven and realize what a waste of time. I, I find the shaking the goodness of God, repenting the goodness of God leads us to that. So I want to tell you the stuff that I haven't liked, what I've seen or in the team I lead or some of the churches, our pastors, friends, son, and I'll just say, thank you, Lord. You revealed, you're bringing us to a place of what's really inside. We didn't know until we got shaken. God shakes us to sift us. There's a sifting. There's a huge sifting in the church and out of the church. And, I, and we don't like that word, but it's there. And I'm not ready to say that God's judgment in the house of God, like everyone else is in 1 Peter chapter 4, maybe. But I think judgment's a lot more than this. But okay, that's fine. But I do know there's a sifting. And what the season has done has revealed the, our loyalty to so many things but to Jesus. Again. We don't want to get political, but we were more loyal. The church in America was in the hands of politicians than more than the hands of Jesus. Politicians knew. They come every four years to the church, get her to buy into your thing, promise her all this stuff, and she'll vote for you and stand for you. And I, Fine, but God's saying loyal to me, not to a party. We've been loyal to people and groups and ministries and whatever, and God says, I'll shake this stuff. So you're now back to exposing who you truly loyal to. What a season, huh? He also shakes us to strengthen us. This is the good that comes. Purifies us. There's such purity that comes from the shaking. I, I'm watching His church be purified. And I'm delighted. And I'm part of that being purified too. He's positioning and directing us from shaking. He puts us in the right places and positions us for the place and direction, friends. See that. Many of us were headed one way, God did shaking and positioned us to go where He wants us to go. All of us can claim that, including me. I mean, just run with stuff and God shakes you. Whoa, I don't need to do that. I don't need to do that. This is what God has for us. He's positioned us for this season in this time and we can lead His people through it. He strengthens us by protecting us, not just from illness and disease. He has protected me by this shaking that's taken place. I'm telling you, friends, I don't know how much longer I could have done what I was doing, and I had no idea. Honestly, the Lord shakes, and He protected me from going everywhere and doing all things. So has He protected you and your church, because you and I were heading for things that everyone else was doing. The Lord said, you don't need that. Now you say, well, what do we need? That's awesome, man. What a time to be part of His church. Goodness of the Lord, He's shaking. Strengthens us. He, he shakes us to perfect us. Maturity, friends. My word. We've all said this a year ago, before we stopped gathering and all the stuff we were doing, we thought we were pretty mature. And I think the shutdown, lockdown, and pandem pandemic, and racial stuff, and injustice, and political, it's revealed how immature His church really is. Yeah. But it's also forced His church to grow up quickly. Yeah. We've grown up. We've done some growing up because of the shaking. And that's a good thing. Yeah. People have unfortunately fallen away, but many have grown up. Yeah. And that's what God's about. He's doing those things. He shakes us to shape us. Now, I just want to throw these words out to you and let you find out what that means for you. But I felt God say this to me at, at our meeting a few weeks ago while I was worshiping. His shaking is breaking people down. Now, that's probably, I highlight that more than anything in the shaking. But that's one of many. He's not just breaking us down. His shaking is breaking down. He said, uh, he reminded me, his shaking is breaking up. You know, you think about the shaking of God. When God shakes, it begins to break up ground. 
I really believe we've got to lead like this. We've got to live this next season that in the shaking there's broken ground that's opened up. That wasn't open and now we can sow it. So in his shaking, he says, yes, I'm breaking down, but I'm also breaking up. I'm also breaking open. Shaking breaks open, friends. And, and I hope you see that. And I hope, because I haven't focused on that. I've been focusing on the breaking down and the come down and submit and kneel again and and God said yes that's one of many but I'm when I shake I open up things I, I break things open I, I, so he's breaking down he's breaking up and then you're planning and processing as teams and leaders going forward believe this it's not what it was we're not in 2020 we're in 2021 where there's been shaking and the things that are open that were closed break down breaking up he's breaking open he's breaking in so many of us have said, Lord, more of your presence, more of your power. But honestly, we've closed him out because we're so good at programs. Yeah. And then the Lord shakes. And you know what he does? He breaks things down to break in. Yeah. I don't think we should come with expectation of just our thing anymore. Yeah. The Lord says, I've shaken, so I'm in. No longer wondering if he's part of it. Now we are part of his because he's shaken what's not his. I love that. It gives me such boldness and courage in what we're doing because it's Him now, not us. Breaking in, breaking out. There's a breaking out in the shaking. And I believe there's a breaking through. Breaking through. Now again, I don't know what those all mean for you, but I challenge you to go and ask God to tell you what that means for you. Because I, I know this is a brave statement. I believe God's told me to tell you this. And he told me for me to know this because I was missing it. Breaking through. There's breaking through that's happened because of the shaking. It's not all bad. It's not all gone. There's a lot of good breakthrough. That we are, we can lead now with that breakthrough because he's shaken things for the breakthrough. And I believe our response. We need to know how to respond. Our response is fourfold. Number one, we need to draw close. I've shared this, and I know you've heard this, but I want to say it's not one thing at a time. It's all four at the time. Our response to what's happening out there is we need to draw close. John 15, we've all, I don't know what preacher who hasn't preached on John 15 or quoted it in the last while. Why? Because abide in me and I'll abide in you. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Why? Because we've come to that place. Remaining in him is what matters most. You know what's been challenging is that I've talked to everyone who says to me, if only I had more time. If I had more time, I would spend more time with God. Yeah. And you know, for one moment, I don't know how long, but a few months, we had more time. Yeah. Everything yeah. stopped. Yeah. And 90% of those people who said, if only I had more time, I would spend more time with God. They didn't spend more time with God. Why? Because they got busy with other stuff. Mm-hmm. What it boils down to is not time, it's priority. And if we have priority, we will make time even in our busyness. Yeah. That's, right. That's not an accusation. It's truth. Because we've always said, if only I had more time. Well, we were all globally given more time. What did we do with it? And if it wasn't with God, don't feel bad. It just means your priorities are wrong, not your time. Yeah. But there is this drawing close. And we've all been forced, in a sense, to draw close. Mm-hmm. And He wants us not to have drawn close to now move far. Stay close. Draw close to Him. First and foremost, lead. As I shared here last time, I think it was, if you keep reading John 15, most stop there. Keep going where it says, I, I, I no longer call you friends, but now I call you, I mean, I no longer call you servants, I now call you friend. Why? Because we've got to lead God's people with a place of intimacy, not servants of Christ, friends with Jesus. I believe 2020 is going to have some surprises for us, but if we're leading at the feet of Jesus, friends with Jesus, we should be less surprised. We were caught off guard. The prophets were, but stop blaming the prophets. We were caught off guard 2020 and all that went on. Why? Because maybe we were too busy being servants, task orientated rather than friends. And I'm guilty of that. I was busy with the mission and the mandate and busy with the task that lay ahead. Nothing wrong, but I missed some things that the Father would have shown me if I connected with Jesus as a friend. Not doing things for Him. 
doing things with Him. This season, we need to do it with Him, not just for Him. Draw close. Draw close to each other. Draw close to partnership. Draw close to your people. Man, we need each other. Work your stuff out. If you haven't realized that, you're missing what God's done. The need for people and partnership and input and direction and, and people being straight up and friendship outside of having a coffee and saying, G'day. we need to function better together. Yeah. God wants it. People know they need to be in church. Yeah. Online, I get it, friends, but it's not ever going to be God's way to replace I'm just telling you, there are regions still in the nations that we work in that are shut down and they're getting comfortable. And I want to tell you, Chris and I went to, uh, to Placerville, yeah. <laughs> so I think in Northern California in like August last year. And shutdown was still real. Everywhere was shut down. But Steve's like, we're going to have a meeting and we're going to, because we had to go and do a releasing of a, a plant and so on. So we went. And I mean, they had hundreds of people in the outdoor thing. I mean, for a minute, I felt like it wasn't a lockdown. It was awesome. And I was like, well, the cop show up. And they're like, well, my, the, the, the sheriff's in our church. Don't worry, he's good. And so I'm preaching going, I'm hoping no cops show up. Because, but it was amazing. And then we went to start. I was like, gee, maybe there's no such thing as this pandemic. And we went straight to Starbucks and then was shut down, locked down, and put your mask on and get arrested. And I was like, okay, this thing is real. I said to Chris flying home, I'm never going back to online alone. We can't. It's not even for the sake of gathering the need for God's people to be together. I'm telling you, friends, don't buy into the lie. Maybe I'm being strong. Here. Don't, have your, don't give the forum for online only. I'm watching guys say, no, no, online, go online, it's convenient. Yeah, it's not God's way. It's a way, but it can't replace being together. Don't buy that lie. You'll miss what the need to draw together, be together. Draw close. Secondly, at the same time, not only draw close, bow down. We've got to bow down. Bow down. I wrote this down. We need to be sustained in our surrendering and our submitting. I would beg to say that many of us are good at surrendering and submitting in a moment. And then we get up and we get on with things. Yes. I believe the drawing close and the bowing down is a sustained surrendering and submitting. And what I mean by that is daily, all day, every day. I've got to tell you, even coming here tonight, I had to change my message because I had what I wanted to preach. Mm-hmm. And then I went for a walk this afternoon just around to pray and I felt the Lord say, submit to what I want you to say. Mm-hmm. I had this great preaching practical how to disciple people and bring them through and i'm trying to get there but clearly we're not going to get there. i felt the lord say no no i know i've told you what to share it's not just a lifestyle it's ministry it's the stuff we do guys it's being bold enough to say in a meeting i had planned this but god do this it's not being leaderless it's just submit no sustain submitting and surrendering Bowing down, he's king, he's Lord. At the same time, our response needs to be lining up. We've got to line up with what God's called us to. We have to, friends. And I want to ask you, please, do yourself a favor and the people you're leading a favor. Go read the book of Haggai again. And I know it's Old Testament, I know it's Old Covenant, but I'm telling you it reveals something of God's heart that I believe is so essential for our season. Haggai chapter 1, you know, talks about where God's house is lying in ruins while men, people are living and building in their paneled houses. And I want to tell you, there's nothing wrong with a paneled house. I don't believe God's got an issue with a nice house. What he was saying is, you're so busy taking care of your own house, and my house is lying in ruins. What did he say? You say it's not time to build my house, but I say it is time. And then he says, my house lies in ruins while you're all living in your paneled houses. Here's what he says. Give careful thought to your ways. Not to your heart, not to your intention, to your ways. And here's what I believe is happening in COVID. We've got so busy 
<clears throat> excuse me, trying to get our houses back in order and our jobs and our lives. And can I even be old enough to say your local church? Like we've just got to get the church thing going again. Then we'll get back to that. I want to, God says this, you build my house, I'll take care of your house. I've shaken for all the stuff to fall and you've been quick to rebuild your house while my house is in ruins. And we know we don't build this house. We know this is new covenant and that, but what about the purposes of God, not our purpose? And I think our people and maybe we, if we're honest leaders, we're so busy building ours to get that right so we can get back to that. God's way will always be, you build that and I'll take care of that. But if you build that, you'll never get to that. So what it's basically saying is put God first. Put His plans first. Not ours, not our church plans, not getting our guys together and getting them all on board and then back to that. No, get that right and this thing will work. And I love the response. I mean, it's a dream of a preacher to share something and everybody responded and that's exactly what happened. It says that even the priest and even they all feared God and obeyed the word and God and the Father said this, and I will be with you. Put God first in everything, not in some things, not in in your thing, in all things. Big picture, always, guys. I I really want to challenge you. I've not asked to grow, and I'm not trying to build my thing. His thing will always be bigger than ours. And if we don't let the ours focus on the big, the ours will take the place of the big. It's always been like. I mean, the nations is not some optional extra when the church is strong. I just want to say, I know some of you are struggling just to get your people back, but God said, don't get your people back. Get back to my house and my mission and my mandate and your people will buy in. Big picture, guys. Big picture always. That's what he says. And then chapter 2 of Haggai is such a cool response. He says, how many of you were part of what was before, basically? It might look like it's in ruins now, but the glory of the latter will be greater than the former. And I do believe that's where we're at. Maybe we've had some glory days. Maybe those of you who have grown up and led in this nation, you might. I mean, honestly, I'm sure I could say to you guys, you must think this thing's a wreck right now. Where's everything? I mean, you must, compared to what was. And you know what God says? For me first, I'm going to do greater things than what you've ever experienced. The glory to come will be greater. Maybe you're leading like now thinking, geez, we had all this and we had buildings and people. Where are they all? I don't know. But this I know. His promise is it's going to be greater. We've got to line up with God first. Not one day we get to God. God only. God first. Think about that in our decision making, my friends. Because you're making decisions as leaders for God's people. They can't be personal decisions. They can't be based on what you're doing for you. It's always got to be what God has called us to. So in landing, we also need to rise up. Sorry, at the same time, we need to rise up. At the same time, so there's man sinning, the devil raging, God shaking. What a time. You better know what you believe. You better be convinced you're called. And you better have your ear attuned to heaven. At the same time, God says, I want you to draw close. And while you're drawing close, I want you to... Bow down, sustained, submitting and surrendering. At the same time, I want you to keep lining up. Keep coming back to what I'm doing. And I want you at the same time to rise up. And I want you to live in all four of those responses while all this goes on. And on top of it, I want you to lead my people in it and through it and not hold out till it's over. Because it might not end because this is our moment for the church to walk. So how do we respond? Well, obviously, there's four ways. But can I just, a couple of minutes, highlight a few things. In this season, we need to prioritize some things. We need to prioritize 
this number one master revelation of who Jesus is. I'm so blessed, to be honest. I've popped in. I've listened to some of you guys preaching. Obviously, been at uh, <coughs> Redemption City. How many guys are talking, preaching about Jesus? I mean, friends, if I can be honest, it blesses me. And it's not about me, but I'm so blessed. Because I'm telling you, friends, that's what this is about. Yes. It's not tag on, add on. And my challenge to you is don't just for this season make it about Jesus. Right. Master exclusively only first. Yeah. We've all said this. Our view of Jesus. Please hear me. Our view, how your people and how you and I view Jesus yeah, yeah. will determine how we view everything and everyone. If you want people to work out their issues with one another, they better have see Jesus for who He is. Seeing Him, I see you, the value of others. If I don't see Him, I don't see that. How I view Christ determines how I view everything around. So my challenge to you guys, you know, keep the main one, the main thing. Our challenge is not to keep the main thing, the main thing. Our challenge is to keep the main one, the main thing. And it's that master revelation. How we view Jesus. He's the Lord of the church. He is the Lord. We know that. Well, if He's Lord, we obey Him completely. He's the leader of the church, meaning we follow Him. He's the lover of our church, means we adore Him. And He's the life of the church, meaning we continue to get to know Him personally to carry that life. You agree? Yeah. I put this text, uh, this thing on Instagram recently. I got so many people light it up, and it was this. The church would be problem-free if leaders were omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. We would have no problems in the church if we were that. But guess what? We're not. Yeah. Clearly, we're not. But do we know who he is? So what's our job? Not to be that, to point him, them to him. Yeah. So again, guys, I know you know this. This is not new. But don't just for the season. Keep the main thing always. Because that revelation matters most. Secondly, message. Our message has not, should not have changed. It's the kingdom of God. And I want to tell you, I think why many have fallen away in this last season is because we've preached the church rather than preached the kingdom. When you preach church, when the shaking comes, church falls. Why? Because church is not kingdom. We're called to preach the kingdom. Read what Jesus preached. Go read the, 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 the uh, Gospels. <laughs> preach the gospel of the kingdom. Went about preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Friends, the message of the kingdom is what we've got to keep preaching if we're building for eternity. Remember that? What we win people with is what we win people to. And, and our, our understanding, if it's not kingdom, they're not getting... When they're not being one into the kingdom, being one into something else. Yeah. Keep preaching the kingdom of God. Thirdly, our mission is global. I did say that. I, I know it's weird to hear this right now, but it's God's call for the whole world. Yeah. Who? Us. Who? You. Your people. The church in America. Yeah. Not just America. Of course, our nation's in hectic trouble and we need the church to shine like never before. Yeah. But at the same time, there's a world out there. God said, go to all nations. It's lovely that Matt's gone, but he's not our representative. We all call to go. Yeah. And we've got to go. And I'm just telling you, even with lockdown, shutdown and all, we've got to have it in our hearts. What I'm concerned about is how the devil has limited us in the season, got us to just be inward and our thing and our region that matters more than anything else. God says, no, all nations. Yeah. Yeah. I hope that's in your heartbeat, guys, because if it's not, it's not in your people. Regions, cities, nations, ethnos, ethnic group, unreached as well as the lost. Don't just talk to lost about lost. God's about unreached and lost. And lost are everywhere in America, but they're unreached people groups in the world that have never had the privilege of rejecting Jesus. And we've got to care for both. If you're an evangelist, you would you care for both because God cares for both. I hear a lot of talk about lost. What about the unreached? They've never had the privilege. Of millions and millions of them waiting. Our season, our time, in your heart, because it's in God's heart. I keep saying, if we don't do X18 well, 
If we don't do Acts 1 8, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. You'll be my witnesses where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outermost parts of the earth. If we don't get Acts 1 8 right from a call and a commission, then we're going to have some Acts 8 1 moments. One's a response of a call, another is a dispersing and a sending out of persecution to the church to get us out there because God says you will get out there one way or the other. That's not a threat, but let me just tell you, let's rather respond than get reacted out there. I'm just saying in this season, I feel God say, if you don't respond, I will shake it to go. You will go. I'd rather go gladly. I'm telling you, X18 or X81, take your pick. And fourthly, I'll land with this one. Mandate is making disciples. We're called to make disciples. We know that, of course. But I, I, I want to just again remind us, elders, it's not do more. I feel like some of us, I mean, we, how many times we talk about ma- making disciples? And we sit there and go, gee, I've got to do more. I, I don't believe do more. I believe take what you're doing and make it intentional. That's all. No tricks. Just be intentional about this. Matthew 28 is all authority. Verse 18, all authority in heaven has been given to me. Now go and make disciples. That's what he says, right? Go, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything. I've commanded, and surely I'm with your ways. Go, make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them. Making disciples, here's what I want to say, implies being intentional. It's a process. It doesn't just happen because the church exists and people show up. It's a deliberate process. And I want to keep saying this. If we're not actively producing disciples... Well, then we're automatically producing consumers. And that's probably what was revealed in this last season for the church in our great nation. Consumers rather than disciples. I want to just say, coming out of this, if we're not actively producing disciples, we're automatically going to have more consumers. That's why we've got to be intentional. I think there are three keys to making disciples. It's got to include evangelizing absolutely and i've loved the emphasis on evangelism in most of the churches that i've heard from and even in our church our cousins are talking about evangelizing and we're praying for the lost and, and i'm delighted we've seen people get saved how many guys are talking about people getting saved online praise god because truly you can't disciple people without getting people saved it starts with that followers of jesus making followers of jesus So evangelism is part of it, but it's not for salvation or for a decision. It's being added in. God added. We love that. Acts chapter 2. God added. They did all this stuff. They devoted themselves to apostles' teaching, to prayer, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and whatever else they did. And it says, and God added to their number every day. Didn't just have it to salvation. They were added. Right? So we need... To see people saved. We had a prayer le- Tuesday night. It was a, uh, yeah, pray here. And listen, guys. I mean, I'm just telling you. I love We've got lists of who we should be praying for. And I've watched these guys. I mean, they're writing names on the air. And I'm also, people getting saved and crossing. I mean, it's awesome to practically see that. And I think it's great. I've got lists. I mean, I've got guys at the gym that I'm trying to reach out and endure all their nonsense and their hatred towards politics. And old dudes who talk about hunting. I'm not even interested, but I'm trying. And come and eat bear with me. And I'm like, all right, whatever. I'm trying to get in there so I can get these guys saved. They're on my list. And this morning, I was trying to get to the gym. I spent more time talking to some old dude who's lonely. And I'm like, I don't want to do this. I need to work out. I'm in a hurry. But I'm, they're on my list. I'm not saying lists are wrong. But I want to tell you, last, the other night when we were praying here, I felt God, you said we need to get prophetic in our evangelism. How often do we put prophetic with evangelism? And what I felt, we were talking about the Father's heart, right? And the heart of the Father was being revealed in our prayer meeting of God's heart for people, the Father's heart. And then I felt God challenge me and us to say, hang on, don't just have your list. He's got a list. And that Matthew, or whatever that parable is uh, of the banquet, I felt God say, 
that, that he said, go and invite all these people to the banquet. They were all on the list. And all those on the list had an excuse of why they couldn't come. Those on our list are have excuses. And then the, the master said, well, then go onto the highways and the byways and compel those to come so my house will be full. And I felt God challenged. I stopped the prayer meeting. Remember, I was like, hey, guys, just, yes, our list, but God has a list. Yeah. And we so focused on reaching those on our list, we're missing others that God's called us. Be prophetic. There might be a moment you walk to someone, he's not on your list, you don't even know. God says, he's ready, she's ready, I've readied her, someone else has been. Just be a little more prophetic rather than stick into our list. There's a season of salvation. Harvest is now, but it's got to be being prophetic in evangelism, not just one-on-one trusting through our list. Is that okay? If our gospel isn't touching others, it has never touched us. Yeah. It's also just landing with us. <laughs> Making disciples is evangelizing. It's also establishing. Because we have to bring people back into kingdom stuff. You, you can't be discipling people if they are not being brought into order. Part of discipleship, shepherding, pastoring, is bringing order in the midst of chaos. Right? That's what kingdom does. The kingdom, when it breaks in, when the rule and reign of God breaks into a life, it brings order to chaos. We can give them the books and we can give them all the direction and all the thing and pray with it, but until they have this lordship and this rule and reign of God break in, they'll never have order. Marriages can't work when there's no order can do all the marriage counseling you want. It's not going to help. We've got to see people evangelize. we also got to see our people uh, established. Yeah. That's what a follower of Jesus is. Kingdom of God, rule and reign, bringing order into chaos. And thirdly, true equipping. I mean, uh, uh, making disciples is about equipping. It's evangelizing. It's also establishing. And it's equipping. And I, I want to say equipping and empowering. Yeah. And so w- we said this already this earlier. It's not about doing more. Mm-hmm. It's about being effective with what you're already doing. Yes. Here's our challenge. Take what you're doing now and bring these three things into it. Equip people through the gatherings you already have. Guys, I really don't believe we have to do more. I feel like we just got to get practical and spiritual and practically equip people in all our gatherings. Prayer meetings, elders meetings, deacons meetings, whatever other meetings. Sunday gatherings should be about equipping people. It's not let's have an equipping meeting outside. These times, I want to make it, I really feel we've got to get better at equipping. Not just go and do it. Teach people how to do it. Every meeting. How do we do that? I'm honestly landing. I'm trying to just give you some practical things. I'm sorry I've taken so long. Six a year, if we're lucky. How? Can I just give us a quick thing? Purposeful meetings. Guys, I'm not saying let's take control, but I am saying let's have purpose to our gatherings. Let's come with that expectation and let's teach our people. These gatherings are essential. There's an expectation. There's purpose. It's not just let's get together and see what happens. Yeah. I love the Holy Spirit stuff leading us, but we better have some purpose to why we gather. Intentionality. Yeah. Purposeful meetings, gathering to grow up so we can go. Every meeting, I believe, has purpose and structure to it. It's going somewhere yeah. or towards something. The question is where. I believe the purpose for our gatherings must always first and foremost be any gathering to engage God first. Are you there? Mm -hmm. The crisis in the church today is not the songs we sing. It's the people's reluctance to even engage God because there's no even expectation that God's there. We've got to shift this. We've got to change this. We've got to be intentional about this. Meeting to connect with God. Gathering to worship. Someone said that the real crisis day in the church is not that people have no sense, is that the people have no sense of the presence of God. And if they have no sense of His presence, how can they be moved to express their deepest feelings of their souls to honor, revere, and worship and glorify Him if it's just a song we sing? 
Just forgive me, you muse us. Just let me have a moment with you quickly. And I've tried to get to this list so many times. So can I just get to it with him? And I love you. Right? We need you on board with these things. It's not us and them. It's us together for him. When it comes to worship, it's the heart. It's not the art. It doesn't have to be so awesome and so good. And listen, we can get better and must get better. But it's the heart God looks at. We are so good sometimes, maybe not us here, but let's not get so good with the art that there's no heart. Someone said you cannot find excellent corporate worship until you stop trying to find excellent corporate worship and pursue God Himself. God's not looking for excellent praise. He's looking for hearts that pursue Him. So worship leaders, worshipers, can I ask you a couple of things, please? We need worship leaders to point us to Jesus. If we're equipping, if we're engaging, if our meetings have purpose, we all want to be more like Him. Well, then point us to Him. We need to take care, you worship leaders. Forgive me to say this. Take care not to distract from Jesus, whether by content or creativity. Make sure that your artistic efforts adorn Jesus and not obscure Him. He's our greatest gift. The greatest gift you can share to us. Are you with me? I was going to preach about this chapter too, which is me. Worship leaders, we need you to lead more than perform. Worship leaders, we need you to approach the worship gathering. Can I be bold enough to say with a pastoral sensibility what do i mean think primarily about the flock's needs rather than their wants because they're not always the same thing worshipers leaders let theology drive your decision making too many meetings i think are driven by consumers or pragmatic approach it's not a rebuke. This is an encouragement for you and I to come on board together to get the job done God's intended us. I think we've got to also, can I say, worship leaders, think about the service beyond the Psalms. Yes. And we also say, leaders, don't be afraid of silence. Now, let's not all go silent all the time and become monks in a monastery. <laughs> But I want to tell you, there is the pressure on anyone, no doubt on stage, and the guys leading a meeting, the pressure's there. That everything has to be flowing, and there's got to be something happening all the time to keep people engaged. And here's what I want to say. That pressure's worldly, not godly. Not every space has to be so thick with sound and visual. I know silence between songs is sound like awkward transitions and doesn't look so good. But not every square inch of the worship needs to be produced. You know, I love it when worship leaders embrace the real. We've had meetings. I mean, TK was there and Sandy were there too and some of you. We've talked about this where we were in South Africa. We, I don't know if I've asked you. Were you guys there? Were you there when we had the angels sing? I know you were there. You were next to me. I'm telling you, you were there, Andrew. So here's the thing, guys. I'm not trying to recreate this moment. I'm just telling you, we would have missed something if we played the normal game everyone played. And there was this moment, and God was doing something, and there were, and then there was silence. And like I'm talking, five thousand people in the room. My dad was leading the meeting. I know what it's like to lead those meetings. He was leading, and there was silence. And so the prophets lined up. Because they had the word. Because words come when there's silence. We all got to do something. I'm not mocking. It's just, come on, someone do something. The worship leaders are looking around. My dad's like, no, no, just be quiet. Something. God's doing something. No, I know my dad. He doesn't make anything happen. Just be silent. Just be quiet. I mean, friends, for minutes, minutes, there was this pause, right? And I'm like getting uncomfortable now. Like, dad, just flip. Just, there's a hundred dudes who've got words there's a big band. We go, just, just do something here. This is awkward. And my dad was not being weird. He said, God's doing something. Just wait. God, just be silent. And then all of a sudden, and there were people there, so I'm not making this up. Never happened before for me and never since. We just heard angels begin to sing. Angels. Now let me tell you, 
Oh, me and the angels. When the angels sing, it's the fear of God. TK was standing next to him. It was he, right? I, all I heard TK fall to his knees and he said, Oh God, don't kill me. That's literally what he said. Standing next to me, he dropped to his knees and said, God, don't kill me. You know, he, he try that on a guitar and a keyboard. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> and I ain't against those things. I'm just telling you, we're not trying to create those moments, but we all want to make room for God yeah. to truly break in. So there's an expectation. So don't just not have music now and don't go quiet and awkward. And, but I'm just trying to say God wants to do some stuff. And we're under such pressure. And I understand your pressure. I get it. I mean, it, I really do get it. I lead. I lead at most things. And when there's silence, everyone's looking tired. What are you going to do? And I, I can quickly get up and do something because I know how to do that. I just feel like, whoa, hang on, maybe God wants to do something different. And let's just have a moment. Don't be afraid of silence. I love it when worship leaders pray for real. Not put on a prayer so we can get to a song. Pray to your father. Talk to your father like he's your father. Not a put on to get us to sing your song. Be God conscious in your prayers. Sound like you're actually talking to your father, not some hookup. It's going to help us get through. Can I also say, prioritize the Word of God, worship leaders. Listen, feelings are great. But our life is not dictated by our feelings, even spiritual feelings. It's inspired by the infallible Word of God. Let's hear the Word. Let's, let's, let's prioritize the Word of God in some of what we do. Leaders, worship leaders, lead with serious joy. Serious joy. When worship leaders capture both the gladness and the gravity of responding to the call of worship. When you're both happy and humbled by the holiness of God. That's a good place. So we gather to encounter Him, to envision, to be in vision. Vision, friends. Our preachers preach vision. If we're going to use our opportunities and our gatherings to equip people, vision, we gather to be envisioned. Vision unites. We, we're there to be encouraged and inspired, meaning it's not just the preacher, but I'm encouraged by testimonies I hear from people before I get into the meeting. People's testimonies should encourage us. People, we're there to be enlarged, to grow up. We're there to be equipped. Make sure we're discipling people. We're there to be enlisted and empowered. And so... Those of us who preach, <laughs> the muse us get a moment of breathing here. The purpose of a sermon is to provide a world in which our congregation can live. Yeah. If we're going to be equipping people, let's present truth that helps people live in it rather than discuss a subject with no intention or action. I know it puts pressure on us to hear God more and maybe be better in our developing, but if we can utilize our gatherings to be more effective, it's not be careful what you preach. Just present stuff that we can live in. That's what Jesus did. That's what Paul did. After we preach, I, I think people should understand and feel the text at as, as such a level that they, they long to be more obedient to Christ. I think if you're a preacher, it better frighten both the overconfident and the underprepared. Preaching is vital in the church. Someone said, if your church was a ship, preaching would be the rudder. It's what moves the church. It's not a subject we discuss. It's empowering and delivering. It convicts people. It corrects people. It challenges people and it com comforts people. That's preaching. All right. Preach, just what I want to say, preach with intent and content intentionality as well as content. Don't just have content or don't have con intent. Does it make sense? Yeah. We're not discussing a subject. We're actually achieving an object, yeah. equipping people. Yeah. We can all be better. I want to be a better preacher. And I've said this, one point caught is better than ten points taught. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. If you're privileged to minister regularly and weekly, uh, I look back at just some of the regrets I have in leading local churches is I try to preach too many points because I was always in and having to leave. And that's easy to say now, but I think one point taught 
and caught is better than trying to offload 10 points and no one gets. Right? And so people said to me, well, geez, Tyron, if it's one point, I mean, geez, what's, we're going to have to make a good point. Yeah, then get rid of the other points. It's like, it's better that people catch one than have 10 that they don't get. I'm not saying only be one point, but let's labor what needs to be labored so people can respond and actually grow in it and respond and be it rather than hear about it. It's just be more effective. It's not, I'm challenged by this. When you preach, be a distributor, not a manufacturer. Yeah. All we do is distribute the word. We have to come with clever concepts and wise words and manufacture some ministry. No, no. We just dispense, disperse in the Word of God. That's all we're called to do. No tricks. It's awesome. It takes the pressure off us. Yeah. Come back to the Word. The Word of God brings authority and power and humility and yeah. integrity and confidence. Preach your own revelation, my friends. And I know you know that, but it's, not, it's fine to borrow other people's stuff, of course, but make sure it's yours first. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just regurgitating, vomiting. You've, you're serving people vomit. I'm wondering why they're not going. And I'm not saying everything mine is mine. What I'm saying is you've got to own it and before you can minister. Yeah. Right? So preach your own word, own revelation. Be organized in your message. You prophetic, wonderful people, we need you, but be organized in your preach. It's great to be prophetic. And anyway, you know what I'm saying. Prophesy all you want, but have, it, have some, somewhere you're going in your preach. I mean, it's a privilege and an opportunity. God bless you. It's a privilege to preach to God's people. Can I, I don't do this well, use preaching time wisely. What do I mean? Don't waste time on introductions. Or long intros. Just get to the point. I was taught this thing about a Texas Longhorn preach. Have you heard about that? A point here and a point there with a bunch of bull in between. That's basically it. <laughs> Just get to the point, right? <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm trying to get there. <laughs> Are you here in the heart? I mean, again, we're developing leaders and preachers. Let's get better. All of us. I want to be a better preacher. Preach to, please hear this, friends. Preach to, not at individuals. Preach to people rather than at them. In our passion, our desire, we get... We get in a place of speaking at people. I want to tell you, people don't receive when you're at them. There's no equipping when it's at. Jesus wasn't at. He, he called some people out. But when he was talking to his people, he, decided, he equipped them. He spoke to them, not at them. It's a big difference. Effective preaching is personal. It's people talking to people. Speak the truth in love. Someone said love makes truth palatable. But truth makes love practical. Do it in love, even if it's rebuke, even if it's a... And you guys are called to do that. And from the pulpit, we do that. We don't even know we're doing it. But if it's done in love, people want to live in it. If it's done with the wrong heart, friends, you're destroying people. Be positive in your preaching. (laughs) Even in a tough moment, a tough season, even going through hell and back. Be positive. Why? Because this is good news. I've listened to preachers recently. They're not positive. I'm like, I, I don't know what to say. The, the truth you're speaking is awesome, but the way you're presenting, it's negative. Just be positive. Maybe smile. I know Tika says he's got his smiling face. I just think, do your best. I'm not using. <laughs> just smile if you can. Or, I don't know, not him. Anyway. <laughs> Honestly, people can receive. You know my dad? He's so good at rebuking without knowing you've been rebuked. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's not because he, he just smiles while he beats you up. <laughs> And you go home so free, and then you're like, hang on, I just got rebuked there. And it's not, I'm not trying to be like, just, just be positive in what you're addressing. That's all. I think it's going to, oh, Lord, help us. Be positive. Preach. Can I also just say, preach in the present tense. <laughs> Don't linger in the past and history and history and even biblical history. Come, bring it to where we're at. We need to know what to do with what you're telling us. Right? Make it relevant for the present. That's what we're called to do. Take Old Testament, Old Covenant, and bring it to where we are. I know some of us are brilliant in our thinking, but help us who are not brilliant live in what you're trying to teach. By just bringing it to the present. Jesus would identify stuff of history to now. 
That's your job, my job as a preacher. Use illustrations wisely. I, I don't know how more to say. Please. I mean, I, I, we all look for illustrations. We go looking on the internet for an inter- to back our point. But that's the point. They to back your point, not take the place of your point. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I listen to illustrations. Rather not have one if it's going to yeah. take away from what you're trying to tell us. I'm confused by some of the illustrations. Uh, do you notice me? I try not to use them much. And people say it's a bit boring if you just gave us some other. My illustrations are not the point. Yeah. I'm not saying don't have them, but use them wisely. Use them for why they're there. Is that, is that, we're talking about equipping people. If you want to entertain people, tell them stories. If you want to equip people, tell them the Word. Don't preach yourself rather than the Word. How to conclude the response. I, I don't think we can equip people if there's no response. And I'm not saying have an altar call every week. I'm just saying this is our response to what God said. Help them take steps to what to respond. Jesus did that. I think that's equipping. Try to conclude with it. Give them hope, a way out, a way to respond, rather than go home and pray about it. Be humble in the pulpit. In your success stories, be humble. Yeah. I've got stories I can tell you how I've been so, God sorted me out. Anyway, use we and I rather than you. Please do that. I'm just going to tell you, maybe it's one of my pet peeves, and I'm not thinking of any of you. I've been in meetings when they say you need to, and God wants you to. And I'm like, when I say, well, what about you? How much? <laughs> if I got up here and said, God says, you guys need to do this, and you need. Yeah. I'm not even an elder, and I'm saying we all the time, because I'm trying to include myself here, so you don't feel like I'm rebuking you. God's saying to us. It's easier to take truth when it's a we rather than a you. I know when you talk to the youth, you've got to pound them, but don't bring that into another gathering and watch older people not even listen to you because you're rude. Young guys, don't tell you. Say, we, we got it. God wants us to. Expect God to confirm what you say. And lastly, preach Christ. Preach Christ. Don't add him on. Don't tag him on. Don't mention his name and then get to your real truth. Preach Christ. I believe after you preach, our people should know more about Jesus than anyone or anything else. Can I say, if you're truly inspired by the Holy Spirit, then your message will be Christ. He will bleed through every word because the Spirit is totally occupied with Christ. When someone's teaching from Scripture and being true to God's Word, the preacher will unveil Christ through the text. Jesus will be drawn out and lifted up from the pages of the Bible because scriptures are totally occupied with Christ. Christ will be on the lips of our people who are walking in the Spirit and He will leap out from their lives. And churchgoers will know their Lord better than their programs and their preachers. If we do not present Christ, then someone said, well then we minister. When we minister, we're not only missing a note, we're playing the wrong tune. I've got a whole thing on pastoring through this. But anyway, we, that's, I've gone more than long. But I had to talk to the preachers because I think the musos were feeling like we were having a go at them. So I'm having a go at me as a preacher. Pastoring too, just being effective in our pastoring. That's where I wanted to get to, those three things. Purposeful meetings, I'm telling you friends, will change how we see if we go after those. Don't do more, just use more of what you're doing intentionally our preaching and our pastoring don't waste time on people who don't give you time invest in those who are waiting to be invested in give them your life back them get behind and bring them on and bring them through love those who are needy but invest in those who are ready to be released learn to discern the difference love them equally but Lead them different.